Welcome back to our series on Bach's Eutelbüchlein. And today we're looking at one of the Christmas chorales, Via Christenleute. The hymn itself says that Christians can rejoice because Christ is born, God is with us, and therefore there is no condemnation, and therefore everybody can sing Hallelujah. So it's a general hymn of Christmas rejoicing. Bach's prelude in some ways reminds me a little bit of Heut Triumphierer Gottes Sohn. Both, of course, are in G minor. Both have this recurring pedal part, almost like a passagalia, but not quite. Um, both share very much of the same figuration, very many of the same harmonies, and have the ge same general feel. I'm not suggesting for one moment that Bach was deliberately trying to couple those two in any way, but that the nature of the two respective hymns just awoke some of the same feelings in him, and he's treated them in rather similar ways. One of our new subscribers has written in to ask if I would talk a little bit about the difference between phrasing and articulation in relation to these pieces, and I'm very happy to do that. So just to deal with phrasing, first of all, Phrasing, in the context of Wardley Buchlein in particular, um, describes how we deal with the chorale melody. In other words, you will phrase off the chorale melody at the ends of the lines of text. And that's about it. You won't find yourself with, or shouldn't find yourself with, phrasing marks in your music in the same way that you would, for example, if you were playing a Reger or a Kargelet. Phrasing is something that comes naturally, in a sense, from the articulation, and it's the articulation we focus on, apart from that one thing of the chorale melody, which needs to get the long-term shape. So what then is articulation in this context? It's something which is localised. It's how we treat each individual note, but at the same time, it's not just the graduations, how the graduations of notes affect the individual notes themselves, but also how they affect the longer term flow and direction of the music. As a general rule, articulation in Baroque and pre-Baroque music, and as I say, I'm speaking here in terms of a general rule, so there are exceptions, there are particular circumstances, but articulation emphasizes the beat for that reason, it's very, very unusual, for example, to slur across a beat in Baroque music. And very often it sounds wrong, even where it's very natural to do when you're playing. So it's something we need to be very careful about. But even when we get to the very end of the 18th century, into a whole new era of Haydn and Mozart and so on, and there was vastly more discussion about the emphasis of individual notes, often at the expense of the nature of the beat itself. Even there, uh, theorists like Koch, Heinrich Christian Koch, who wrote in his Musicalische Lexikon in about 1802 or something like that, I think, that the articulation primarily serves to heighten the beat itself and the nature of the beat. Let's look for a moment at the pedal part in bars three and four. Bar four is straightforward. The two upbeats in both cases are going to be shortened slightly to heighten the downbeat. Da dum da dum bum bum. Going back to bar three, we get exactly the same pattern twice over. But between the two, what do we have there? Do we, in other words, make the octave leap relatively legato? which you can argue with the purpose of making the beats themselves the most important, or do we separate them, which you can argue since it's the same pattern twice over. And that becomes an even more pertinent question in bars 1 to 2 or 6 to 8 or wherever, where you get long chains of these figures. But there's a similar question regarding the figuration in the hands, where you get this figuration here. We can ask ourselves, should it effectively be this, or should it be this? 
Now, on the one hand, it's perfectly obvious we're supposed to be emphasising the beats, and so therefore it's this. But on the other hand, a third of the times that you get that particular pattern, the pattern begins with the quaver being tied over from the previous beat, which means that you can't emphasise that quaver. And secondly, and it's here perhaps that personal taste creeps in, I feel that the pattern like this feels rather too aggressively metrical and that the other pattern, this, feels more convincing. But that, of course, is just my subjective opinion. But there again, you're watching this because you want to hear my opinion. I'm not sure that there is one correct answer. I can mention here, and you can regard it as relevant or not, that in the 18th century, there was a great deal of interest in oratorical expression in music. That is to say, the music saying something. And that the logical or oratorical expression, to some extent, was allowed to override the metrical accentuation, where it was felt to be necessary to put across some kind of a point. And you can regard this da 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 dum da 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 dum da 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 dum pattern, for example, as putting across some kind of musical argument that contradicts the necessarily the uh, accentuation of the beat. We're moving into rather abstruse territory there, and I don't think we've got time in this short film to look into the possibilities of that. But if you're interested, then you can read up on it uh, rather more uh, elsewhere. In any event, to go back to the question, Phrasing is something that occurs only at a meta level, an overall level um, of shaping the structure. Whereas articulation is concerned with how the music is propelled along by the individual notes and the accentuation that's given to those notes and the articulation. So if you're worried that your scores don't have a lot of phrasing marks in, in the way that they would in a more romantic repertoire, then don't worry about it. Focus more on the articulation instead. So back to this prelude, registration. The hymn itself is bright and optimistic, cheerful, positive. And the registration, I think, of the choral prelude can reflect that. I'm not a great fan myself of using reeds for this particular piece because I feel that the reeds can easily make the music come across too aggressively and I want to avoid that. But of course it's your choice. There's no ornaments to worry about in this piece and the tempo itself also is relatively straightforward. I think we can probably take it from that pedal line tum ti dum bum bum which just creates that sense of movement and uh, forward impetus. There's one textual oddity about the piece, and that is that there are repeat marks shown for bars 9 to 15. That's very odd because the chorale itself doesn't have a repeat at that point, and nor is there any real liturgical reason for having a repeat, and the piece is long enough without it. So it's very hard to understand what Bach had in mind. But nonetheless, if you look at the score, the repeat marks are there completely clearly and unambiguously. Peter Williams makes the suggestion that perhaps the marks were intended as an indication that you could miss a bit out to shorten the piece. I think that really is clutching at straws because Bach, for one thing, doesn't use repeat marks for that purpose elsewhere. Secondly, there is nowhere else in the Orgelbüchlein where Bach does suggest that you can miss a bit out. And thirdly, it wouldn't be liturgically appropriate to do so. I, I don't see any possible way in which that is a realistic option. If you want to miss out the repeats, do so, because the piece does function perfectly well without them. Some editions do actually just suppress the repeats without showing them. Even the novello edition with uh, Walter Emery does so for some reason, although I don't quite understand his uh, logic there. 
I'm going to play the repeats because in this series of films we're concerned with being a little bit more accurate. Uh, in some circumstances, I think I would also miss out the repeat. <laughs> 